Hello, everyone. So in this lecture, we'll go through a bit more calculations than in the previous one, and we'll go through the, all the components needed to compute the two most important processes which are considered in particle physics, meaning particle decays and particle scattering cross-section. In the first part of the lecture, you'll go through the phase space and common kinematics, which is present in all the processes which we can consider next. So basically, we'll derive them once, and then we'll be able to use the derived formulas in order to compute some of the examples. As previously, after going through the material of the lecture, please uh, post your questions which you have on the material by using the new anonymous Google form, which is uh, the link for which you can see here. And in the next lecture, we can go through all the questions which you uh, have after listening to the videos. So let's go to the topic of our lecture. All calculations in particle physics revolve around particle interactions and decays meaning around transition between different states. And these are basically the experimental observables of particle physics, which are then compared with the theoretical calculations. On this slide, you can see an example of two plots. Left plot corresponds to the summary of the standard model production cross-section measurements for various processes performed by the Atlas collaboration. And so you can see there are set four classes of measurements performed at different center of mass energy, and all of them are compared to the theoretical prediction, which is listed in gray. And as you can see that so far and over many orders of magnitude, we see a remarkable agreement between the theory and the experimental measurements here. And in the left plot, you can see an example of particle decay rate measurement in case of a Higgs boson. So you can see that here are the couplings of the Higgs boson to various particles like muon, tau lepton, b quark, wz bosons, so top quark, are plotted as a function of particle mass. And the, the line here corresponds to the values expected from the standard model Higgs boson. So again, you can see that yeah, at the moment, the measurements of the properties of the Higgs boson really correspond to what is expected from the standard model higgs boson particle. So this is the example of how theory meets experiment in these cases. And in this lecture, we'll go through the theoretical recipe on how to compute uh, such processes. So if you talk about the transition rate, we can remember quantum mechanics and use Fermi's golden rule in order to compute this transition rate. So here, gamma fi, number of transitions per unit time from initial state i to final state f, not Lorentz invariant, would be equal to 2 pi transition matrix element squared times density of the final states. And transition matrix element can be expressed through the perturbation theory and it's equal to the leading order contribution where we have perturbing Hamiltonian between final and initial state, and some through uh, higher order transitions through some intermediate state J. So as you can see, the transition rate would depend on matrix element. So this corresponds to fundamental particle physics and the density of states rho. And density of states is basically the kinematics of particles. This part of the lecture would concern this part of the transition rate. Let's consider a two-body decay, where we have initial particle i decaying to particles 1 and 2. We would like to calculate the decay rate in first-order perturbation theory using plane wave description of the particles or Born approximation. So in this case, wave function can be represented as a usual plane, plane wave, where n is the normalization uh, coefficient and notation p times x correspond to the four vector uh, scalar product. For the decay rate calculation, you would need to know in the Lorentz invariant form the wave function normalization n 
Then the transition matrix element from perturbation theory and the expression for the density of states. Let's first consider the wave function normalization. In the non relativistic formulation, wave function is normalized to have one particle in a cube of site A. So you have psi psi star integrated over some elementary volume is equal to n squared a cube and should be equal to unity which corresponds to one particle. From here you derive the value of n squared. Also we need to apply boundary conditions that wave function is vanishing at the box boundaries and from here we get quantized particle momentum. So we have expression for each component of the particle moment px, py, is z expressed through a. And the volume of the single state in the momentum space would be equal just to this expression. When we normalize to one particle per unit volume, we get number of states in element d cube p. So we have basically dn equal to d cube p over 2 pi cube. Therefore, the density of states in the golden rule can be written down as this expression. Now we can transform elements in the equation 8, dn over dp and dp over dE, by using the equation 7 from the previous slide, this one. So you can easily compute dn over dp. From here we get the expression for dn over dp, and then we can remember that E squared is equal to P squared plus M squared. And from here, we can get dP over dE, which is just equal to 1 over beta. From here, we get finally that density of states is proportional to P squared and inversely proportional to beta of the particle. Um, now, in the relativistic formulation of decay rates and cross sections, we will make use of the Dirac delta function. If you might remember, this is basically an infinite, infinitely narrow spike of unit area. So basically, we have function which is equal to zero everywhere apart from one point where it's equal to infinity. And then the formal definition of the delta function is that integral of delta function from minus infinity to to plus infinity is equal to unity. And then if we have delta function multiplied by some function f, then such integral would be equal to the value of the function f at point a. Any function which has these two properties can represent delta function, like for example, an infinitesimally narrow Gaussian function. In relativistic quantum mechanics, delta functions prove extremely useful for integrals over phase space. Since, for example, again, if you look at the decay where particle A goes to, to particles one and two, we can use delta function in the integral to express energy and momentum conservation. So if you look over all possible values of the energy of particle one and two, moment of them. So this expression would automatically correspond to the moment of energy conservation in this decay. Now let's look how the delta function of a, of a function would look like. So delta of f x. We start from the definition of a delta function. So integral of delta function between points y and y1 and y2 would be equal to unity if 0 is between y1 and y2 and 0 otherwise. Now we express everything in terms of y equal to fx, where f at x0 takes value of 0. And then we change variables. So we get basically the same integral from x1 to x2, have function delta of f and add a derivative since you change the variables. And this should be equal to the same expression as previously. Now from the properties of the delta function that is only non-zero at x naught, we can take out the uh, derivative and write down that it should be equal to this expression. Now we can rearrange this and express right-hand side as a delta function 
So you will get that uh, this integral is equal to one over derivative at point x naught, an integral of delta function. Therefore, we reach to the final expression which we were seeking here. The delta function of a function is equal to delta function of initial variable divided by derivative of this function at x zero. Now what we can do is uh, rewrite this expression for density of states using this delta function. So in this case, dn over de at the final energy would be equal to this expression since final energy is equal to initial energy. Note that in this case, we do an integral over all final state energies, but energy conservation is taken into account explicitly by having this delta function in the integral. And therefore, the golden rule becomes an integral over all allowed final states of any energy. So we have this expression instead of this one here. For the end, in the two body decay, we need to consider only one particle since momentum conservation fixes the other one. Therefore, we get the rather simple expression like this one. However, we can include momentum conservation explicitly by integrating over the momentum of both particles and using another delta function. So what we do here, we just insert another uh, term which corresponds to the momentum conservation, insert another integral, acquire another factor of, of two pi to the cube here, and get such a symmetrical expression in terms of v1, e1, and e2. So, so far we uh, normalized our wave function to one particle per unit volume. Now, if you consider relativistic effects, we can remember that when changing reference frame, volume would contract by gamma factor, which is equal to energy divided by mass. Therefore, particle density would increase, would increase also by the same gamma factor. Therefore, relativistic invariant wave function normalization would need to be proportional to the energy particles per unit volume instead of unity. The usual convention adopted is to normalize to two E particles per unit volume. So Lorentz invariant wave function normalization would be equal to two E. Therefore, if you take psi prime equal to 2e, here we are missing 2, 2e, square root of 2e psi is normalized to 2e per unit volume. We can define Lorentz invariant matrix element MFI in terms of the wave function normalized to 2e particles per unit volume. So MFI would be expressed through the psi prime and would acquire square root of products of two energies of all participating particles times TFI. In the case of a two-body decay, we get the following rather simple expression. Now we need to express TFI in terms of MFI. And what we will get in the Fermi Golden Rule, we will get additional factors of two initial energies of the particle and energies of the particle produced in the decay. In this case, matrix element M uses relativistically normalized wave functions, and therefore it's Lorentz invariant. Then dqp divided by 2 pi cube to e is the Lorentz invariant phase space for each final state particle. The factor of 2e arises from this wave function normalization. And as you can see that this form of the decay rate is simply a rearrangement of the original equation, but the integral is now would be framed independently. Then you can see that gamma is inversely proportional to the energy, the energy of the decaying particle EI. This is what's expected from the time dilation in principle. And then finally, energy and momentum conservation are expressed uh, in the delta functions. 
So here is the expression for gamma, to which we arrived. And since, as we saw, this integral is Lorentz invariant, we can evaluate it at, in any convenient frame for us. So we can take, for example, center of mass frame. There, the initial energy would be equal to the mass of the initial particle, and the initial momentum would be equal to zero. Therefore, this integral would look in the following way. Now we can integrate out P2 by using this delta function and get the following expression where we need to compute only the integral over P1. P2 squared also can be expressed through P1 since delta function imposes that P2 is equal to minus P1. Then we can expand and write down the dq P1 in spherical coordinates and get the following integral which you need to compute for gamma. We can write it down also in another form. We have integral over matrix element, function g, and delta function of f. g would be just equal to p1 squared over v1 v2, and f would be equal to this expression. You can see that delta of f imposes energy conservation. So this is just explicitly the energy conservation in our decay. Um, the requirement that function f is equal to zero determines the center of mass momenta for the two decay products. Basically, we can find some value p star, for, where p1 is equal to minus p2 equal to p star, and is determined from solving this equation. Now we can integrate equation 31, this one by using the property of delta function. So by using this derivative. And we'll see that it's just equal this expression, where p star is the value for which f and p star is equal to zero. Finally, we need to evaluate this derivative, which is rather straightforward. And we get to this expression. At the end, the our transition rate would be proportional, would be equal to this integral, or if you simplify it further to this expression. Then we know that f at p1 is equal to zero, and we have energy conservation, e1 plus e2 is equal to me. And finally, therefore, you get this simple expression for the transition rate, which is proportional to the matrix element squared integrated over all angles, and has an additional factor dependent on the energy of the initial particle and mass of the initial particle. In the particle rest frame, EI is equal to MI, and this expression is simplified even further. And this expression is valid for all two body decays. Value of the P star can be just obtained easily from uh, previous condition that F at p star is equal to zero, and p star therefore is equal to this expression. So with this, we finished with the decay rate of a two-body decay, and now we will switch to the cross-section computation. But first, we start with the cross-section definition. Cross-section sigma is equal to the number of interactions per unit time per target divided by incident flux where flux is number of incident particles per unit area per unit time. The cross-section sigma can be thought of as an effective cross-sectional area of the target particles for the interaction to occur. In general, of course, this has nothing to do with the physical size of the target, although there can be exceptions, like, for example, neutron absorption. Sometimes, or rather often, it's also useful to think about differential cross-section instead of a total cross-section. And in this case, differential cross-section, in this case noted as d sigma over d omega, is the very same number, but basically a number of interaction going into a small angle d omega divided by the incident flux. And here you can see an example. So you look at the number of electrons scattered of a proton in some 
uh, elementary angle d omega. In case if we integrate over all possible values of these angles, we will arrive at the uh, total cross section. Here is the simple example of how to perceive the cross section. We can consider a single particle of type A, this red dot here in the plot, with velocity VA, which traverses a region of area A large containing and B particles of type B per unit volume. In time delta T, a particle of type A that traverses region containing and B times the A plus V B, A delta T particles of type B. And then interaction probability obtained from the effective cross sectional area occupied by this number of particles of type B would be equal just to this expression or to equal to N B V delta T sigma where V is just the relative velocity of these two particles. So rate per particle of type A would be just NB, V, and sigma, where sigma is this uh, cross-section which we would like to compute. If you consider the volume V, the total cross-section rate has to be multiplied by the total number of particles of vol in volume V, and it would be equal to this expression. So basically, rate is equal to the flux and B times number of targets times the cross section. Now let's consider the scattering process where you have particles one plus two scattering into particles three plus four. And again, we can start from the Fermi's golden rule. We have again two delta functions for the energy conservation, for the momentum conservation, integration over uh, all possible momenta of the final state particle and transition matrix element for normalization of, him, of per unit volume. Now rate over volume would be flux of particles one, the number density of types of particle two times the cross section. So it will be N1 times V1 plus V2 times N2 times sigma. For one target particle per unit volume, rate would be just equal to relative velocity times sigma. So sigma is equal to the rate divided by the relative velocity. And we get the expression for the cross section. We just take this rate and divide it by the relative velocity. And now we can see that there are parts in this integral first, second, and third, which are not Lorentz invariant. Now, to obtain the Lorentz invariant form, we would need to use wave functions normalized to two energy particles per unit volume as previously. Again, we can define a Lorentz invariant matrix element M and replace it with it the matrix element T. We'll acquire additional to E1 to E2 here and to E3 and to E4 in the integral. Now you can see that the integral is written in the Lorentz invariant form. For this, we need to confirm that this factor here is Lorentz invariant. So the thing is that it, this expression can be written in terms of a four vector scalar product like this. And therefore, it's automatically a Lorentz invariant. Therefore, we find out that this cross section is also a Lorentz invariant quantity. Now we can compute two special cases of Lorentz invariant flux. First case is center of mass frame, where we have two particles colliding at their center of mass, like in typical uh, particle collider, like LHC, for example. Or we can have a case where target particle, particle two, is at rest. This would correspond to the uh, fixed target experiments. So in the first case, this value for this quantity F would be equal to 4P square root of S. And in the second case, it would be equal to 4M2 times the momentum of the incident particle. 
Now what we can do is to apply above Lorentz variant formula for the interaction cross-section to the most common cases. And uh, for the first, at first we'll consider two to two body scattering in the center of mass frame. So we have two incident particles, one and two, going with momentum pi and minus pi, and then scattering to particles three and four is also momenta equal and opposite sign. We start with the general expression and remember that p1 plus p2 should be equal to zero, p1 plus p2 would be equal to square root of s. Therefore, this ex expression simplifies in the following way. This integral is exactly the same as appeared in the particle decay calculation previously. The only difference is that mass of the initial particle is replaced by square root of s. Therefore, we can automatically write down the answer to this integral. The sigma is equal to this expression. So in case of the elastic scattering, the initial momenta would be equal to the final momenta, and the expression for the cross-section would simplify even further. Now to calculate the total cross-section, which is Lorentz invariant, the result in the previous page would be sufficient. But it is not so useful for calculating the differential cross-section in a rest frame other than center of mass energy. So differential cross-section would be expressed like this. But the angle the omega star here refers to the center of mass frame. And uh, for example, if you have fixed target experiment, we would prefer to have some different reference frame. Therefore, what we want to do is for the last calculation in this section to find the Lorentz invariant expression for d sigma, which would be valid in any reference frame. We will do this by expressing the omega star in terms of the Meldenstam variable t, which corresponds to the square of the four momentum transfer. So t is equal to q squared, is equal to p1 minus p3 squared, and to the following expression. In the center of mass frame, we can express p1 as this one, then p3 is particle scattered for some angle theta here, P1 times P3, therefore, is equal to the product of these four vectors, and T can be expressed in the following way. From here, we immediately get the value of dt equal to this one. And therefore, we can express d omega star through d cosine th theta d phi. So for this, we just take d cosine theta expression here through dt and get the following expression. Therefore, differential cross-section would be just equal to this expression. Finally, we can integrate over d phi star, assuming that there is no phi star dependence of the matrix element, and get the expression for differential cross-section. All quantities in this expression are Lorentz invariant, and therefore it would apply to any rest frame. Also, we can know that P1 star is a constant fixed by energy momentum conservation, like this. Now, as an example of how to use the invariant expression d sigma over dt, we will consider elastic scattering in the laboratory frame in the limit where we can neglect the mass of the incoming particle. E1 is much greater than M1, like, for example, in the case of the electron or neutrino scattering. In this limit, P1 is simply equal to this expression, and d sigma over dt can be written down like this. The other commonly occurring case is scattering from a fixed target in the laboratory frame, like electron proton scattering. First, we can take the case of elastic scattering at high energy, where the mass of the incoming particle is neglected. Therefore, m1 is equal to m3 is equal to zero, m2 is equal to m4 is equal to m large. So, such a diagram. We would like to express the cross-section in terms of the scattering angle for electron. 
since this is typically what is measured in fixed target experiment. So d sigma over d omega would be equal to d sigma over dt times dt over d omega. Here you can use our expression for d sigma over dt and compute just the new term here. Again, we can use the formament of particles, incoming particle, fixed target at rest, scattered particle, scattered target. And from here we compute the value for t, which is equal to this expression. Again, from the energy momentum conservation, we have this following relation, and therefore express t in terms of particle two and four as well. So in this case, you'll get that t is equal minus two m e one minus e three. E one is a constant; it's an energy of the incoming particle. Therefore, this um, derivative is computed from here and just equal to this expression. Equating two different expressions for t gives us possibility to express e three through e one and cosine theta. Therefore, the derivative is again can be easily computed and is equal to d3 squared over n. Finally, d sigma over d omega is equal to this expression. Again, we can use the S definition for specifically this case. And remember that p1 squared is equal to zero. So from here, we get the value for the differential cross-section of the electron scattered over a fixed target in the limit of zero electron mass. In this equation, E3, if you remember, is expressed as a function of cosine theta. Therefore, we get the differential equation as a function of the scattering angle theta. The general form of two to bo two body scattering in the lab frame where mass one can be cannot be neglected can be written like this after a similar procedure. So here you can see there is only one independent variable theta since others are fixed from the conservation of energy. Now summary of all the discussion is that. We used the Lorentz invariant formulation of Fermi's golden rule to derive decay rates and cross sections in terms of the Lorentz invariant matrix element. So wave functions are normalized to two energies per volume. Main results if you obtain this particle decay rate, scattering cross section in the center of mass frame, invariant differential cross section, which is valid in all frames and differential cross-section in the lab frame for massless particle. And the same for the particle which has mass. In the next lectures, you will see how to calculate one missing part in all these formulas, meaning matrix element, which depends on the process by which the interaction happens. So basically what we have done, we dealt with the kinematics of particle decays and cross-sections, and left out the fundamental particle physics, which is present in the matrix element. So the above equations would be the basis for all the calculations that follow further.